I just wanted to welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, my name is Di McIntyre, and I'm the executive director of, of IHEA. And I'm just handling the technical details today, so I'll be in the background. But I just wanted to thank the Equity Informative Economic Evaluation Special Interest Group for organizing and hosting this um, webinar on health economics and equity research in the digital age, and particularly looking at the implications for achieving universal health coverage. Next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping rules or um, housekeeping issues. Um, if we could just ask you to keep your microphones on mute during the presentation so there isn't um, a lot of background noise. Um, please feel free to use the chat function um, or Menti, which we'll show you just now, to, to share comments uh, and share ideas. Um, and also, you know, in the discussion sessions, you can, you can raise your hand if you'd like to, to make some comments. And the last thing to, to just mention is that the meeting is being recorded because not everyone can participate live. It's not at a convenient time for everyone in every time zone. So it is being recorded uh, and we just wanted you to be aware of that. But I'm, I'm going to hand over to the presentation team to Sadamini, who's going to um, kick us off. But thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Diane, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and just before we get started, as Diane mentioned, we'd like to hear a bit from you. Um, please uh, scan this QR code or go to menti.com. Uh, and put in the code or uh, 37017650. Uh, we'd like to hear a bit from you about what equity means. So I'll just give you a couple, uh, a minute or so to log on. You'll be able to see the code. Uh, I'm just gonna switch the screen now to another slide. Okay, we have one person who's logged in and who said equity in health means fairness. Can we have more people log on? We should have at least maybe 10 more people log in. It'll just be a moment. Okay, equal opportunity. Anyone for equality of outcomes or any other ideas around? Okay, equality and that it works for all. Okay, I'll wait for at least two more in uh, entries before moving to the next question. Justice, okay, and taking a rights-based approach, ethical aspects, and again, uh, the idea of it being about uh, focusing on the marginalized as well. Great, thank you for raising some of these points, and I think these will be good pointers for our speakers today as well as we go through uh, the discussion. I'll move in the meantime to our next question, which is to just ask you, what do you think are some of the key challenges in conducting health equity research? Here, we'd like to ask you to pick one of four options. First, uh, regarding uh, that there are inadequate measures of health equity. Second, that there are there's a lack of methodologies for quantifying equity. And third, um, that um, the political support for equity informed decision is an area of concern and fourth, any other. Can we have more people sign in? It's interesting to note that no one has no one is as uh, concerned around. OK, so we do have uh, people picking all four choices. All right, 
So hopefully that's whetted your appetite a little bit. Um, how to click on it. Um, okay, Naomi, maybe you can just uh, put in your choice in the chat if that's okay. Methods, okay, all right. Yes, you do need to sign in to menti.com. Sorry, uh, Naomi, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so it seems like the current view is that it's about political support um, or lack thereof um, for equity informed decisions. And on that note, um, perhaps we'll move on to uh, the next uh, part of our agenda. And please keep um, keep the mentee on uh, because you will be able to then share any additional questions or comments on it as well. And as they, uh, Dan mentioned, please feel free to use the chat as we go along too. So, in terms of background, I think the reason why we are all here is because we do see um, that equity considerations in uh, accessing health is an important area. Um, but what we do what we do see is that there's increased attention and recognition of it as a major issue uh, in health economics as well. Uh, within the context of COVID, we've also seen a rapid acceleration um, of digitalization of especially the health sector. Um, and this, while it has presented many opportunities, has also come with many challenges, whether it be in terms of uh, geographical divide um, in access to uh, digital technologies or access to different subgroups as well. Now, digitalization of the health system is not new and there have been frameworks that are available and they, there is an urge or interest in using these more systematically so that we can assess the impact of, equi of uh, health technologies in the system, taking equity into account. With this background in mind for today's webinar, we would like to focus on two issues. One is to understand a bit more about these equity issues in health system, particularly in the context of this massive uh, uh, disruptive change uh, through digitalization in the context of Asia, and to also exchange lessons on what could be the role of health economics and health service research to address these issues. We have three uh, very uh, distinguished speakers with us today. Um, Dr. Pia um, Han, uh, Hanvoran Wongchai will be providing opening remarks uh, and speaking to health equities in the context of digitalization in Asia, uh, the current path and consequences for achieving universal health coverage. He'll be followed by Dr. T. Sundara Raman, who will speak on monitoring equity in health system. Um, after which we'll have Dr. Kyoko Shimamoto, will speak about equity analysis in health economic evaluations in Japan um, and methodological considerations in digital health equity. After that, we'll open up for a discussion and we hope that you'll be um, there to participate actively with us. So to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Pia, um, he is the Secretary General of the National Health Foundation in Thailand and the Program Director of the Equity Initiative at the China Medical Board Foundation in Bangkok, Thailand. So without further ado, I'll hand over uh, the, um, the floor to Dr. Pia, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sodamini, and, and thank you uh, I here for the opportunity to uh, be here with you and to, to learn with you today. I would like to share a few slides to accompany my very short remark just as to start off to kick off uh, it is wonderful to be here and i think the discussion today actually highlight one thing that happened to me when i first started uh 20 plus years ago as a health economic researcher i was fortunate enough to be one of the member of a team under dr virosh who's a senior researcher well respected health economist in thailand in, in, in joining this research group, which is called Equitab, Equitab, uh, look at equity in health system in 13 countries in the region. Uh, it also has technical uh, leadership from uh, 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 some senior researchers uh, from Europe, including uh, uh, Professor, Professor Wagstaff, Van Osler, and Owen O'Donnell, and others. 
but but one thing I learned from from that period is that uh, doing equity research is something not common. <laughs> I think at that time it was still still something something rare to a certain extent, and but very interesting and very important. It's also quite difficult to 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 find the method. I think so. There are many asked very interesting questions with those choice earlier about about what are the challenges in doing this and. And I would say at that time there was still discussion, but over time I think there's some uh, agreement on some of this, the way that we would like to measure some of the aspects, especially linked to health financing. But the third thing also very important is the lack of data and information that will help us or allow us to do a more uh, a gradient analysis of what, what we found. And, and I think moving forward 20 years, I think these are, some of the concern might still be there, but we have improved a lot. Uh, one thing that probably uh, impact not just our lives. I think uh, we we all were uh, we all were impacted by this upcoming pandemic, but we also learned many lessons. And and to me, there are at least uh, uh, two important lessons. The first one is, is basically what we are discussing today. It's about system health system is severely and, and could easily be, be, be impacted by, by the pandemic or other new emerging diseases. And, and, and the impact is not just about medical care or health care, and it's not just about the disease or the virus. Usually all of this actually have broader, broader pathway that involve uh, uh, many aspects, for example, the disease, the germs itself uh, uh, can create disease uh, and that require healthcare. But the measures that we put in public health measure, quarantine and some others also have uh, impacts on both the demand and supply side. And even broader impact from economic aspect of the, the countries, uh, some of other social consequences from the pandemic. And these uh, have uh, both direct and indirect effects on the household and societies. And, and, and all of this at the end will influence our health. So uh, I would like this as a lesson to allow us to have a broader systems thinking system approach to when we try to do health equity and health system. The second important lesson for me is that definitely uh, in I think almost every country COVID-19 disproportionately affecting the poor, the minorities and, and a broad range of vulnerable population. And this is a finding from a study that uh, was done in 13 countries. I was uh, lucky to be one of the contributor. And, and, and usually if we don't have equity or, or, or inequality lens to put on things, it's very difficult to, to, to see and to try to identify and to try to measure and address the problem. Um, what do we need to do? I would suggest that for health equity research uh, to reduce health disparity and, and, and advance equity, need to basically take to, into account what digital age, which is the theme of today, uh, impact us. Uh, um, I think digital age is not just about digital health or digital to health tools like uh, 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 what you call medical apps or telemedicine, even though those are important uh, instruments that actually uh, the pandemic uh, enable those uh, technologies to be adopted and, and uh, spread it more widely. But digital age also means that we have more data and information. And digital age also means that we have potentially changing digital environment, the environment that we live in, the ecosystem that we work. Uh, I, I'll just share a little bit. For example, uh, we, we, we probably have seen telemedicine or others, uh, digital health tools that may allow people to have better access. Uh, they may be able to reach out to people in the remote areas and, and that would enable uh, better or, or, or lower inequalities in terms of access to healthcare. Uh, but also uh, digital health tech and tools and transformation could potentially 
improve efficiency that allow us to have more resource to do to do more work in that sense. But there are potentially also negative side of that. For example, if you have so many technology and tools, people, many of us in health technology assessment field knows that not all of them are effective, not all of them are safe, not all of them are uh, of good value. So, so the, the, the role of health technology assessment potentially will be even more important. Uh, 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 there's also potential uh, negative implications in, in terms of the, the, the focus. For example, if your tools and technology allows only people who have good digital skills, only people who are in certain areas who have good internet to access them, then you may actually uh, indirectly exacerbate inequalities from the digital divide in the, in, in the ecosystem. And, and that, if you don't take into consideration, may, may actually uh, 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 lead to some impact on health equity. The issue about data and information also uh, very, very important. I think in the past, I mentioned earlier, when we want to do health equity research, not easy and, and not, not much available. Data sharing is also difficult. But in the digital age, I think we have a lot of opportunities in terms of the availability of the data, not just uh, medical care or treatment data, but there are a broader set of information that at least now being collected both uh, by uh, service providers, but also by the patient or the people themselves. There's also public health information that uh, are routinely collected and all of this are easier to share doesn't mean it's happening, no? but but at least in theory, it could be possible that we could also combine data from multiple sources to allow us to do a better research, to build a better knowledge about the problems that we want to solve. And, and this is another uh, important contribution that I think we could have. At the same time, we also need to be aware that data and information could, in the digital age, may be coming from certain groups of population, maybe may be limited to, to certain uh, uh, people who have uh, digital access. And, and that means people uh, who were left out, uh, your analysis or your, your findings may be actually impacted by this uh, bias. Similar to what we all know these days that a lot of our clinical research were done with specific, a uh, certain group of population, like I was in a conference the other day only, only probably about five to 10% of the, 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 what do you call, uh, clinical trial samples were of Asian. If we talk about that, majority are usually white. When we use the data from that, then there's a inherent uh, uh, bias or, or, or limitation in terms of what that means. And the last thing on the uh, low part is linked to the issue about digital environment and ecosystem. And I think, uh, this would means that we will be in the age where communication, sharing, and others would be done very much in the in the digital uh, platform or digital media. But that also means that this uh, ways of communication and others, including flow of data, would be uh, uh, could be easier. Would also means that some of it may have a different ways of of uh, operation compared to what we have been familiar with in the past. And as a researcher, I think it's important for us to, to, to think and be prepared for, for this kind of changing uh, digital landscape, digital environment, and, and how this digital environment and ecosystem also impact the people that we are, we are uh, doing study. Um, before ending, I think, uh, as the focus on health equity research, I would call upon the, this nice frame by Kilburn that talk about research and health equity disparities, which uh, basically asks us to look at not just about detecting or define and, and, and look at the situation, but, but we would probably want research that allow us to understand and also identify potential pathway actions that will help us reduce equity. And I'm very glad to, to, to be here today to also listen to our two 
uh, speakers who will talk about how they are planning or working on this kind of research and also from all of you who participate uh, hopefully at the end of uh, in the discussion part of today to to be able to learn more from all of you so I think that's that's it for me for now and thank you uh, so Dominic for having me yes Thank you so much, Dr. Pia, uh, for that nice presentation and highlighting how we do need to take a broader perspective. And I, I think your experience also shows how we've come a long way when it comes to uh, research on equity, where there was uh, limited uh, methods, tools, and even people who were working on it. And now that's expanded uh, to a broader group. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll encourage those on um, participants to share um, or note any questions in response to Dr. Pia's presentation in the chat, um, just so that if you would like to add and we'll uh, address them or we'll discuss them together towards the end in view of the time. Um, in this uh, instance, we'll move ahead uh, to our next presenter, uh, Dr. T. Uh, Sundara Raman. Uh, he is the global coordinator for the People's Health Movement and has he's had an illustrious career um, leading institutions of academic uh, academic institutions uh, and has was also formerly the executive director of the national health systems resource center uh, in the government of india uh, today he'll be talking to us about uh, monitoring equity and the challenges that that presents um, and without further ado i'll hand over to dr sundara raman as well over to you sir Okay, um, am I audible? Yeah. yeah, so this is quite a challenging topic, even without adding in the context of digitization. And that adds a new dimension to this problem. Uh, now, equity, I saw those very many definitions and I was happy that they started with fairness. There are many over there. But equity is fairness. And in that sense, I will come back to this again, is an ethical statement as much as an economic one. Uh, there are, when we are concerned with equity in health systems, many different things we are concerned with. We are concerned with the difference in health status between populations, also the outcomes of health systems or performance in terms of outcomes. We are concerned as an independent uh, concern with uh, access to healthcare services, irrespective or uh, to outcomes and status. We are uh, work with equity in terms of resource allocations to reach uh, more uh, marginalized sections, sections which are historically pushed back and how to bring them on. And as uh, the earlier speaker, Pia also pointed out the consequences like we saw in COVID-19 of ill health and interventions. You know, you have uh, the consequences are very unequally born and the poor and marginalized suffer from illness far more than uh, the rest of the population on that. And at some point, a very simplistic uh, horizontal principle of equality, the difference between equality and equity um, expresses a lot, but uh, equity is really unfair equality. And at some point, we will have to go to the, this issue. Now, much of the concerns of uh, measurement have been about effectiveness and efficiency. With effectiveness, there is not so much of a conflict, but with efficiency, what is an inefficient allocation can be equitable and an efficient allocation can be inequitable. In fact, many allocations that tend to prioritize inequity can be blamed as being less than uh, uh, efficient on that. But a further complication is that the felt needs demands, uh, if you are re re responding only to criteria like the willingness to pay or to think, then our uh, uh, it can exacerbate inequality. 
in many ways because uh, so in some sense there are measures of equity that can actually uh, do harm also and need for measurement of changes with changes in context and different interventions now digitization raises new possibilities for being able to measure changing level equality so to elaborate the distribution of health the status of health of different population subgroups and understanding under this the determinants of health both the proximate determinants and the larger socio economic determinants of race ethnicity caste and the economic quintile and the mechanisms that sustain disparities and uh, how is the how do you attribute to health systems when over 50 to 70% of the overall uh, uh, attribution for the outcome or a change in outcome is to social and environmental determinants so if there is a equity is it a, 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 is it a, to be directly related to the design of health systems or is the against a certain background are we trying to has health systems performance try to address equity in access to health care can be by many parameters geographic area gender religion status economic quintile occupation and the effectiveness of strategies to address it even if equally even if equal access is provided may not be equitable access that problem is one of the things and we see this much more with financial protection if you decide that some packages of health some elements components of healthcare has to be universalized preferentially on that very questionable statement that healthcare for the poor is poor healthcare then you may leave the poor more undercovered for a number of wider range of diseases than the not so poor and that would be in some sense uh, not in favor of eliminating the disparities that exist there is also a problem of what do we actually measure as access coverage is a very uh, uh, very non specific ineffective measure effective coverage is better if everybody is covered or enrolled in an insurance is hardly uh, coverage but the proportion of people in need who have had access to services that are affected can sometimes be quite a challenge to present because each one of these the need the access the effectiveness has variables within it one uh, approach which is extremely useful is to measure unmet healthcare needs a thing that has been understated in the literature it's there in earlier literature there's been a gap in recent times so when we talk for example um, uh, uh, i don't know many of you may be familiar with the tudor heart theory of hearts that half the people who have a disease are diagnosed and he was talking about non communicable diseases and of them half are put on treatment and of them only half are controlled we i had a doctoral student do a study in rural chatisgarh and he found that about 1 in 3 diabetics have been diagnosed 1 in 7 hypertensives 1 in about 25 people with a rheumatoid or a chronic arthritis and 1 in 100 uh, uh, chronic depressives who have depression to the extent that it interferes with their uh, regular work and and therefore the the degree of unmet healthcare need is very very wide and many conventional measures of measurement that are based on utilization can completely miss that you may get a feeling that in, in some of the measures we got this even in uh, uh, covid 19 in a different way but in many ncds or morbidity studies you will find very poor health systems reporting much lower levels of morbidity than uh, states or uh, nations which have much better health care systems so what is reported as a morbidity itself changes and therefore the measurement of access sometimes unmet health care need measurement is far more useful on that utilization of services is perhaps the most conventional of the lot and uh, with uh, the fact that you may have for example an appropriate level of cesarean section in a particular district but go closer you may find that the number of people who had a need for cesarean section remained unmet and a number of people who did not need cesarean section got cesarean section uh, surgery so utilization with a lot of uh, uh, ifs and buts can pass for access but with great caution and availability of services the presence of a district hospital does not mean that the district population 
is covered for our uh, healthcare in that. That is something that is well understood. Uh, but less well understood or articulated is that enrollment into an insurance campaign cannot be a proxy for coverage under UHC. Unfortunately, there are studies that tend to equate this, and these studies are actually fair studies. Sometimes I wonder whether it is intentionally so. There are equity in resource allocations, financial resources. So if a facility has poor outcomes, do we increase in resources on grounds of equity or decrease it as a pay for performance approach? You know, when we are pushing pay for performance, it's a problem I encounter repeatedly in practice. How do uh, we skill human resources to areas where they're needed most? We know that monetary incentives have great limitations and the package of incentives where monetary is not the most important package of measures. Incentive would be a wrong word. That actually helps to get e human resources more equitably distributed. So there is, in India, for example, I would argue that there are enough healthcare professionals generated. So the real problem is a huge skew in the distribution so that the places which need them most have the least. And at some point, purely market forces or purely mechanisms that express the price that uh, go for public purchasing are unable to offset this. And prioritization of programs, they can be cost-effective interventions, but there is differential impact on the budget as a huge issue and what happens with an equity lens. In consequences, the consequences in terms of mortality, morbidity, greater impoverishment, degree of economic and social disruption of life and suffering, the loss of freedoms. There's a huge human rights angle into this. And those who have already less freedoms are the people who are most likely to suffer the most, including starting from the prison, going into different degrees of migrants or stateless people. And at some point, these consequences tend to come much more heavily upon those who are more vulnerable. Now, when it comes to economic evaluations, how far are we in this? I would submit there are two contexts in which this must be viewed. What is the context of what I would say near universality, where, for example, any country where only the exclusions to the package are satisfied is a good enough introduction to start. Here, societal cost matters as clear commitment by the government to cover all costs. And of the total expenditure, health expenditure, 75 to 90 percent is public health expenditure. And therefore, the societal uh, thing, if you don't treat uh, hypertension, you get far greater strokes and, uh, uh, and uh, let us say, kidney failures. This is a good argument to make in a, such a situation. But in a situation in an LMIC, where if you miss the hypertension and it lands up in stroke, it does not get reflected in public health expenditure. It gets respected incompletely in total health expenditure. It's compensated by an underconsumption of care then the whole systems of how you actually measure this matters. In LMICs, I think Thailand, Cuba, Costa Rica, to some extent Brazil and Sri Lanka have situations uh, where you can actually say that this sort of context exists. But it is also, therefore, its use in priority setting becomes the trade-off is possible. In the usual LMIC context, governments cover highly selective parts of the needs. And the costs of non-coverage are not visible. And priority setting is largely a matter of being able to allocate uh, more resources for. And therefore, the question of ethics and equity occurs very differently in these situations. Political processes predominate in healthcare spending, often a positive sources, because it brings in a lot of things into the measurement that otherwise would not have come in. For example, food supplementation for malnutrition or even in tuberculosis came in far more through social pressures and political process that cost-effectiveness analysis followed and for a long time it came in the way of essential measures that were required on that. And, uh, you know, also many of the measures which are outside the government package, something like 80% of the measures outside, on a cost-effectiveness threshold would be definitely cost-effective. There's no question that insulin is a required treatment for diabetes. But it depends upon the larger ethical frame. If it is a 
extremely utilitarian frame in a background of uh, libertarian ethics. Then you say, I have so many dollars and I will decide where to place them. It is The question is placed about how I get the maximum result for uh, existing money, making assumptions of the all the other. But in an egalitarian framework with the primary purpose is to actually reach out and settle equity, then the question appears very differently. The question of a human rights issue dominates on this. The numbers generated by an HTA exercise are seldom enough and often misleading if interpreted without context. When most of the care is already foregone, the trade-offs are not quite visible. I mean, you don't have measures, large proportions are underreported. The costs of ill care are paid for by patients and not measured, but they're not paid for by nothing. So these sort of issues take a huge issue on that. This is not to say that economic evaluation doesn't have a role in LMICs. They do have a role, though in priority setting, there is a need for caution for procurement of equipment, for a choice between different options in technology, for a, a public health program, for development of appropriate standard treatment guidelines, for regulatory functions. There are uh, things and, you know, getting a nicer value is very useful. Very often, the nicer value that we get does not really inform us of many dimensions of equity, okay? For example, how does it relate to access? If, for example, because of the distribution of uh, facilities, it's far more available in the urban setting, then a greater part of the claims will shift to the urban setting, though the premiums may have been equally paid for by rural areas on that. So though cost effectiveness across the board is true, the budgetary implication, actually the budget expenditure, moves in a very iniquitous direction on that. And I think the next speech will uh, cover some more of this. But what we are saying is at some point, many of these can get very poorly reflected in distributional cost effectiveness analysis. One problem with the distributional cost effectiveness analysis is that it does not measure many of the things that uh, actually uh, contribute to equity. It's not a Pareto optimization approach to actually measuring what the trade offs are. There are things like which is the type of service providers are available, are they qualified to it, factoring in issues of gender resource allocation. Other big problem in going for some of the more advanced uh, uh, economic evaluation techniques is the lack of data which is essential for this by disaggregation. So you have a lot of data, but whether the uptake is in different sections the same, is the disease prevalence rates the same, what are the opportunity costs? How does it play out in different situations of access? Disaggregated data useful for equity analysis is very rare to come by. All of our data sources are weak in uh, generating equity sensitive data. The civil registration and vital statistics is particularly weak on that. All of our cause of death reporting cannot be per se, potentially it can be, but it is not currently analyzed for different equity parameters. Survey data lends itself, but of which there are only two large surveys that are useful in policy level, and of which the latter one, the NSSO, has really not been happening for some time. So there's a problem with that. And the health management information systems suffer from incomplete data, again, a lack of disaggregated data, and huge data gaps in the private data missing on that. Now, digitization could potentially make a big difference. Um, would you be able to wrap up in a minute or so, just because um, of the time? Two some more slides, and I think that should be done. So it increases capacity to gather and analyze data potentially. Increases possibility of getting disaggregated data. You can have name days registered, converted into aggregate figures. Reduces the burden of data recording. Sources, multiplies the sources aggregation and triangulation of data, greater evidence, and the dream of many of these uh, systems, megalomaniac, if you ask me, of regarding every health encounter prevails. Unfortunately, reality is uh, short. Uh, the old problems have actually decreased, and uh, new problems have added on. Uh, data gathering time has increased, data reliability remains a problem, 
the different systems, systems have multiplied. You can have 50 systems in an average district, but they don't talk to each other. And the gaps that were there in the earlier situation continues after digitization. But with new problems added on, now access to data, because the analysis of data takes computerized forms and are much more susceptible to control, access to data and its interpretation becomes very much more difficult. Our burden of disease estimates, our estimates on uh, uh, cause of death in a country as large as India is still very much dependent and not something that is, in, in terms of basic science, replicable in a common sense work. Mining of data, data locked in, and I would caution even about adaptive HTA in terms of local capacity. How does evidence affect policy? Yes, it's important. But the most important stakeholder, the vulnerable population, is usually absent. And if we are going to talk about uh, uh, stakeholder analysis, we need to look at forms of which you represent vulnerable populations in the discourse. And we must end with this caution that digitization, which was once the subject of reform, have any problem and you project digitization as solving it. Now we've reached a situation where digitization is part of the problem and we need to see how we re-engineer much of what we do so as to serve the goals of EPD. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sundara Raman, um, for really bringing our focus firmly back to LMICs and the challenges that are faced. Um, and in some ways, going back to basics. And as you um, very eloquently put, also how digitalization can really be um, used to address the issues that are confronting us in the health system. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone online to please um, share any questions on the chat or also on Menti. I'll post the code again uh, in a moment. In the meantime, allow me to introduce our final speaker before we move to questions, um, Dr. Kyoko Shimamoto. Uh, she'll uh, bring us to the context of a country that is admired for its health system, Japan. Um, Dr. Kyoko is a project lecturer at Keo Global um, Research Institute and has experience in doing uh, equity research in the country as well. Um, so uh, please allow me to now uh, hand over to Dr. Kyoko. Over to you. Thank you very much, Amini. I'm Kyoko uh, from Keo University, Japan. And I thank you very much for the organizer to have this opportunity to deliver my presentation titled Equity Analysis in Health Economic Evaluations in Japan and Methodological Considerations in Digital Health Equity. And yeah, uh, I have no conflict of interest. And I acknowledge the area presentations by Dr. Pia and then Dr. Sundara Raman, and we are very much concerned about equity and the social determinants of health and we hear equity, equality, and fairness that are commonly discussed globally, yet its implication, intervention, and impact to differ greatly across and within the country. So following the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are very much concerned about health and social gaps that persist and they are even widening. So I wish to highlight our health equity research focus in health economics and outcomes research. We know that improving total population health and reducing health inequality. These are two important policy objectives, yet these may conflict. And we acknowledge standard cost effectiveness analysis focus on cost effectiveness in terms of efficiency, but not equity. So health equity considerations in the HTA process uh, in the Asia Pacific, these considerations are evolving in the following two approaches equity in process, that is equity considerations are taken into account in the HTA process with inclusiveness, satisfactory approaches. And the other side of the coin is the equity in research. And that is equity considerations are explicitly applied in the evaluation method and research activities. And globally, health equity considerations in the HTA processes are advancing. Yes, as also presented earlier, distribution of cost effectiveness analysis, for example, and extended cost effectiveness analysis. And capacity building our progress also. And this year in June, online DCEA training was conducted by Professor Richard Cookson, University of York. 
and the recording is available on ISPO's website if you may be interested. And in this regard, I'd like to also introduce my health equity research project, uh, namely health inequality aversion studies. As a background, the health-related social welfare function has been studied to articulate the trade-offs between efficiency and equity. And evidence exists from the European countries, for example, UK and, the U and Spain, yet there is no such evidence in Asia Pacific. So I aim to advance health equity research in HGRL and particularly to understand the public views on health inequality aversion. My study settings include Japan, the USA, and possibly other countries. And the data collection was conducted using online self-reporting questionnaires. And a mixed method study is also completed in Japan, including qualitative data. And from this study, health-related social welfare functions are measured. Indeed, these are one of the required parameters for conducting PCEA. And here are the examples of the policy choice questions. And seven pairwise choices are employed between the two programs, and in which program A favors the rich and program B favors the poor. And each successive choice the years in full health gained by the poor in the program B are gradually reduced. And these are the preliminary key results. And the, this classification system comprises five key categories and 15 specific categories and according to the original UK study. And the five key categories include pro-rich, health maximizers, weighted prioritarians, maximum, and egalitarians. And in the analysis, the point at which the respondent switches or become indifferent between the programs was used to categorize the respondents and derive the level of health inequality or virgin. And here are the preliminary key results. And I found that the majority of respondents are willing to trade off some total health in order to reduce health inequality in Japan. And the Japanese respondents think that health gains to the poorest fifths should be weighted approximately six times, as highly as health gains to the richest fifths in Japan. Yet substantial heterogeneities are observed by demographics in Japan in terms of income quantiles and geographic regions. And also conceptual and cultural differences are also observed and under investigation in this qualitative study. So further comparative evidence will be expected in Asia Pacific and beyond. Next, I'd like to move to the second topic uh, concerning digital health equity. And the COVID-19 pandemic has promoted rapid implementation of digital health care and which has provided people with ongoing access to vital health services while minimizing the risk of infection. Yet we also are concerned that these solutions may have unintended consequences in terms of poverty, lack of access to digital health, poor engagement with digital health for some communities and barriers to digital health literacy. And the digital health equity framework was proposed by these authors. So I wish to introduce briefly on the next slide. So this is digital health equity framework and it comprising six uh, main blocks. And to the top left, uh, socioeconomic and context are identified as so-called social stratification. And the bottom left uh, outlines health systems as a social determinants of health. And in the middle, uh, intermediate factors shaped by social context are identified to the upper side and as well as uh, resourcing and care quality of care to the bottom. Then to the right top, uh, digital determinants of health are listed. For example, access to digital resources, use of digital resources for health taking or health avoidance or digital health literacy and briefs about potential for digital health and values and cultural norms preferences and integration of digital resources into community and health infrastructure. And then to the right bottom, digital health equity recommendations are listed, uh, including equal access to digital health care and equal outcomes from digital health care, irrespective of socioeconomic status. The second point is health providers with competency training to provide equitable digital health care. The third point is measurement and quality improvement to improve access and outcomes. And the fourth point is the involvement of people from vulnerable groups. 
And this slide shows a global leader on internet access by OECD statistics and to highlight the global trend. And this is showing that the percentage of households with internet access is increasing in general. Uh, yet uh, looking at the Japanese data, it is outdated. So I will be showing the recent Japanese data. So these are the graphs from the recent Japanese government surveys with around 40,000 participants. And it is showing that ownership of mobile devices are increasing, particularly with smartphones in the middle to the left and with approximately 70% of individuals. However, to the right, uh, the disaggregated data shows that there are substantial generation gaps and the usage of internet access devices shown by age group and from children age six to the top and to the elderly, 80 years or older to the bottom. And this graph shows internet usage using any device by age group and the blue bars are showing the latest data as of 2020. And this shows that the proportion of internet usage was 26% for 80 years or older and 60% uh, for, the, for the 70s. And although this proportion among young and middle aged adults are reaching close to the 100%. Here are another disaggregated data by age, gender, and household income and showing major gaps. And that upper graph shows that male has better usage of internet than female. And then to the bottom, the lower graph shows that the approximately 6% of the lowest income group had used internet, while it was 93% among the richest groups so there are uh, 34 percent point gaps between the poorest and the richest groups. And I think these are very substantial inequalities. So I think it was already highlighted by the earlier uh, presentation, but such disaggregated data are helpful to understand the extent of inequality first and to be incorporated or considered in assisting health, digital health interventions and as we all know, the need of disaggregated data for subgroup analysis or advanced economic evaluations at the later stage. Uh, next, I would like to also introduce a checklist to guide equity considerations in the HTA, uh, called ACHTA. And this is framed to be considered at each one of the five HTA phases. And the key categories are defined as summarized here including contextual considerations, uh, stakeholder involvement, and methods. So here are examples at the evaluation stage. One of the different category is outcome measures, and under which a key question asks, are the outcome measures chosen relevant to patients' perspectives? And the second key question asks, do outcome measures include the different aspects through which inequalities can emerge? And the third key question asks, is there an economic analysis and does it include an equity analysis? And here is another example at the knowledge translation and implementation phase, which seems to me to have direct implications to the digital health technology. And the first key question asks, do the approaches selected to implement recommendations favor certain population groups above others? And it specifically asks selected implementation methods may not be suitable or optimal for certain disadvantaged groups. And here the literacy issues are mentioned and which could include digital literacy and sync. And as a second key question, it asks, does the prioritization of recommendations to be implemented favor certain population groups? And here specifically, it asks the values uh, to prioritize recommendations and also to consider the disadvantaged groups. And the third key question asks, do certain population groups within each stakeholder category require targeted knowledge translation approaches? And it suggests it might be good to have separate and specific approaches, which would be beneficial to enhance the reach to certain population group. So last, uh, uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to deliver the key messages. 
So I try to highlight the advancement of equity in formative economic operations are receiving an increasing attention and recognition globally and in the Asia Pacific. And second, equity considerations in digital health is also receiving a relevant attention not to reinforce the social gradient of health. And last point is that acknowledging the excellent initiative and effort by the policy and research and the recommendations may include, but not limited to the following. And, and for example, in the context of economic evaluations, I acknowledge the advancement of EPRO uh, electronic patient reported outcomes globally and also in Japan, and the planning and intervention and evaluation of the digital health product could consider a digital health technology that is suitable or optimal to the general digital literacy of the target group and to be accompanied by relevant training. And the second point is the planning and evaluation that would ensure the involvement of marginalized groups and in terms of digital access and the literacy or income and wealth. And the third point would be to separate and possibly specific approaches may be considered for subgroups, including the disadvantaged. So in the following plenary discussions, if time allows, I would be grateful to hear and learn from your experience and recommendations on improving the digital health equity, please. And I end with my sincere acknowledgement to respective researchers, groups, and funding support. And once again, thank you very much for this opportunity and then for, for all of you to join in and coordinating this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kyoko, um, and for showing us a practical example uh, of applying a methodology in the context of Japan, uh, and also highlighting uh, how there are still disparities, uh, even with uh, the elderly population, uh, which is particularly relevant in the context of Asia, which is an aging society. So thank you for highlighting those trends as well. We have a few minutes uh, for question and answers um, for a discussion amongst us. Um, and for those who can stay on beyond six, um, beyond the hour, please do. Um, so perhaps I'll pick up on the question that was in the chat first uh, from Ian, um, which was around uh, assistive technologies um, for um, how to assess them and how to increase uh, their uh, equity in that respect for that group. And maybe I'll turn to Dr. Pia, if you could uh, please uh, address that question from uh, Ian. Uh, hi, yes, I, I think a uh, very interesting question that highlighting the need for specific uh, group and and actually is uh, what Kyoko just uh, highlight also in her presentation. Basically, uh, we probably, I, I totally agree that we should pay more attention to those who need and the question is how the current resource allocation decision is considering these different needs and whether we would like to uh, also trade some efficiency gain for equity uh, benefits and, and example from Japan and, and some other countries, a good, good, good example for, for us to try to make this uh, into a practical policy uh, recommendations. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pia. Uh, we I'm sure if Kyoko has uh, something to add on this. Yeah. Please, Kyoko. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I was trying to highlight this. Yes, uh, inequality issues. Yet, yeah, yes, I think I'm still unable to really conclude what are the extent of the inequality at this point, as we still lack a lot of data and to undermine and to understand the disaggregation and the disaggregated so impacts and also interventions and impacts. So. Yes, uh, we hope we will, as a researcher, we will have more efforts and then to, to enhance the equity informative researches and to understand, understand better on the reality. Thank you, Dr. Kyoko. Um, we have one question also uh, through Menti and um, one question is around uh, whether there are specific vulnerable groups that are at the top of the policy agenda or whether this is uh, defined on a policy by policy basis. Um, Dr. Sundara Raman, uh, any thoughts um, on this question? So I see that um, 
Right. If you are at a global uh, seating, then we do have certain categories that form uh, like migrant populations that uh, have been the focus, large displaced populations, which uh, require uh, effort because no nation would fully own up to them. But within a nation, uh, the priority setting differs. With what is the categorization of vulnerability? Broadly, vulnerability by geography is easier perceived and addressed. Vulnerability by social groups can be somewhat intransigent, especially if there is a phenomena of the other, where there is a the less liberal democratic and welfare statist it is, the more authoritative the state, the more they are likely to construct another and therefore vulnerability, some people can drop off the runner. But I think a very uh, under-informed uh, section of vulnerability is also both certain occupational groups in com combination with the urban poor. So whereas the rural still attracts visibility, things like sanitation workers in the urban space, homeless uh, people, uh, commercial sex workers, are somebody which are in the margin. This, so if the question is, what is the state most concerned about, then it's likely to be a large mar marginal group with a certain considerable political clout. If it is, what are the major uh, vulnerabilities uh, as a overall academic I am looking at more often? I'm looking at groups that the state has in some way failed. Uh, so these are very, very different ways of uh, looking at it. So there's no easy answer to it, but perhaps down that line. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts and particularly highlighting about the issue around migrants, which has also been um, high in the discussion uh, in the context of COVID vaccines um, early on too. Um, maybe uh, any questions from the group here? Please feel free to unmute or raise your hand on Zoom. Maybe then I'll um, ask some of the other uh, colleagues as well to reflect briefly. Um, one of the issues that was uh, highlighted was around, especially for low and middle income countries, was the challenge of data and even in the context of digitalization. Um, and I'd like to maybe pose the question to our uh, other speakers. Um, Dr. Pia, any reflections on that and um, whether there's any headway and what that means going forward? Uh, but perhaps you could reflect in the context of Thailand. Just maybe, sorry to, to repeat, the key part is on the action for equity, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, something that has been in the, at least public health agenda for a long time. And 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 it reflects in, in how we have universal health coverage and and how we, well, not universal health, let say, but universal coverage of health insurance, at least. I still wouldn't want to say universal health coverage in the sense that because there's still people who are not accessing due to others, but at least financially, they, they have they have access, uh, they have coverage. Uh, there were earlier studies that talk about other factors that uh, kind of limit the access, including elderly living in the house with no transport or some other uh, subpopulation like uh, Dr. Sundaraman mentioned migrant workers or others who don't have uh, proper coverage and others. But but generally, I think that the sentiment and the, the public uh, perception about, about universal health coverage, about health financing as a right is a very important fundamental background that allows a lot of issues to be uh, uh, openly discussed and also the policy uh, uh, issues being debated in, in, in the public. And I think that's, that's uh, the, the, the important part behind. And in Thailand, we are trying to move even beyond financing aspect into like what uh, we had mentioned earlier by about effective coverage, about, about even additional aspect beyond medical care. Uh, I think uh, we learned from Anisha about social prescribing, some of those, yeah. So, so those are some of the, the, the interests. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dr. Pia. Um, also linking it then to that broader conversation around universal health coverage. Um, I'll ask maybe one more question to Dr. Kyoko and then turn to each speaker to just give some uh, one thought on what to expect in the future in this, um, what you'd like to see uh, in this space. Um, so Dr. Kyoko, um, you also shared with us a framework on um, the, the application of uh, equity, conservation and health. Um, could you share what that means in terms of um, the different levels at which uh, digitalization impacts um, healthcare and what that means as a researcher? Thank you very much. This is a very difficult question. And I would speak about the level that I'm familiar in, in terms of the health economic analysis. And I have been specifically mentioned about the, the advancing EPRO initiatives. And then I think this has been advancing at the hospital level at this point in Japan. And yet when I look at the recent guidance, for example, by NICE, and it has been also highlighting some cautions against the generalizability of the, the results or the evidence that has been collected from EPRO because they have been highlighting some of the researches showing that several uh, participants decided not to join and they, that these numbers were not specifically reported in the analysis. And then non enrollment was, has been also reported due to the type of application, for example. And then the participants also reported that these, they are more like digital health literacy, they perceive are high. So uh, in this uh, yeah, application of digital health and particularly EPRO, I think the care for planning and intervention would be very necessary so we can, as also Dr. Pia highlighted earlier, we, we would like to have the data that is representative and then that will not leave out any population group and then to without marginalizing. Sorry, it, it gets long, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kyoko. So now I'll just walk through uh, and request Dr. Pia to share something that you're looking forward to, then Dr. Sundara Raman, and then Kyoko. Over to you, Dr. Pia. Um, yes, I think uh, the work on economic relation and integrating equity consideration is very, very interesting in, in health uh, economic and equity research. I think the issue around uh, broader determinants of health, uh, including uh, uh, social and uh, other other aspects also also very important and 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 that that would shape about uh, policy uh, in a broader sense towards equity and and uh, I, I think I think that's that's it for now. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't think well. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Dr. Pia, Dr. Sundara Raman. It's a difficult situation. One thing I can say is there is a technical work that remains to make these methods more appropriate to situations which are far from uh, UHC. I'm not quite sure the methodologies has evolved in near UHC context. Like nobody is a UHC. UHC is a sort of ideal situation. In near UHC context, can be easily translated to our needs. That's one thing. Second, I think that Beyond the technical, we need to move into a larger ethical framework where the state recognizes or built around the value of an egalitarian state at some point. How deeply is that ingrained? And without that, and that needs to be reflected in a legal framework, you know, I've examined the Thai legal framework and I've had some reason to examine a number of other legal frameworks. They're really robust. I mean, I don't know even whether they recognize how uh, they got that right. I really don't know because it's not in their political history, but they do have a very robust uh, uh, legal framework that defends uh, uh, these uh, values. And like the NHSO Act, for example, it's such a uh, out, uh, really heartbreaking act. Now, I, I think that somewhere we will need to move using the international covenant on social, economic, and cultural rights. We need to move uh, into uh, insisting on legal frameworks that can advance the cause of equity. And within that context, say, for the progressive realization, what would be required? So I don't want to say that what was presented from Japanese and Thailand is the ideal we aspire to. But for us now, there is some distance to travel, and we will need to travel both in the political space and in the technical space simultaneously. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Sundara Raman. Kyoko, uh, over to you for your take. Thank you very much. Yes, I have just started my journey in, in doing the health economic research in Japan, and then we still have a lot of steps to move forward. And yes, once again, I wish to stress that in order to measure the equity, we really need to have the disaggregated data. And that has been also one of the challenge in Japan. And I, I noted that uh, on the commemoration of the UHC day, I have checked what are the key facts that they posted and one of the key points is that still inequality continues to be fundamental challenge of UHC. And as aggregated data masks within country inequality in service coverage, and that still continues, I think, in Japan. So I hope we will have better understanding first to understand inequality. So we will have correct steps with follow up. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all for pointing out to where we are now and where we need to be in the future and your aspirations from three different perspectives. Um, it's been a very stimulating uh, presentation and discussion as well. I uh, really appreciate your time today and many thanks to all the participants for joining and for staying with us uh, until the end. Uh, and many thanks to Dee. Um, over to you, Diane. Uh, any closing words before we keep... Uh... All right. Please. No, just... <clears throat> Thanks, thanks again for organizing this uh, absolutely fascinating presentations. And it's, it's always to, good to get uh, presentations from diverse back uh, contexts, um, some that are close to UHC, others that are, are far from it. And also in terms of different levels of inequality within the country, um, from an income perspective and um, in terms of income levels, high, low, middle income. So I, I found it um, really thought provoking and, and thanks very much for organizing it. And thanks to all the speakers. And the recording will be uploaded uh, in the next couple of days on the I Hear YouTube channel. So um, you can please let people in your networks know that it, it will be available. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.